the talk will start after that, inshallah. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Nahmadu wa nasalli ala rasul nabiyul kareem. A'udhu billahi min shaitan wa rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Alhamdulillahir rabbil alameen. Ar-Rahmanir rahim. Maliki yawmiddin. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. Ahdana al-sirat al-mistaqim. Sirat al-lazina an'amta alayhim ghayri al-maghudubi alayhim wa laddadneen. Ameen. قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم بارك على سيدنا مولانا محمد تبي القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبصار وديائها وعلى آله وصحبه دائما أبدا سلاة وسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله. Because time short, last couple of weeks we've been talking about the night journey or the miraj of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم and I want to kind of wrap that up today and then different topics starting next week إن شاء الله. But last week we got to the point where Along this journey, uh, Rasulullah along with Jibreel al-Islam, they reached the point of Sidrat al-Muntaha. And as I said, that symbolizes the edge of creation, the limit of creation. And as Rasulullah continues the journey, Jibreel al-Islam stops. And then he gives his excuse that, you know, if I come any further, then, you know, I will be annihilated, I will be destroyed, all of my wings will be burned. I mean, that will be the end of him. You know, because his nur, you know, the angels are made of nur, but the nur of Jibreel cannot withstand what is beyond that point. And yet, Rasulullah Sallallahu continues. A uh, couple of points to remember. One is Barak, which was the ride of Rasulullah Sallallahu stopped in paradise. Jibreel, which is where it originated from. Jibreel who came from Sidrat al-Muntaha now stops at Sidrat al-Muntaha because he can't go any further. And yet Rasulullah continues. This also shows us that Jibreel was not the guide. You know, the guide doesn't leave you in the middle of, uh, of the journey, or rather when you reach the most important part of the journey. Jibreel was simply a companion along for the ride. And so, as Rasulullah Sallallahu continues, and again, you know, what Rasulullah Sallallahu called this place, which is no place, was La Makan, which means no place. Because he went from place to place to place to place to place, and now the edge of creation, no place. Because Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala cannot be confined to a place. He cannot be confined to place or time. All of these things are the creation of Allah and He is not bound by any of them. And so when Rasulullah continues on this journey and moves, again, I mean, it's no place, so it's hard to say moves forward. <coughs> because what is forward or backwards or up or down? These are terms we use but when we use them, we should understand that these terms don't justify what we're trying to explain because it cannot be explained. Uh, this is beyond our comprehension. I mean, even like today, like you know, these guys who think, oh, science this and science that, and then you, they start talking about time travel or something else, and then you see holes within all everything they say because they try to take something that can't be comprehended and make it comprehensible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts talking about the journey itself with subhan. Pure is the one. He starts off with himself. That pure is the one who took his messenger on this journey. So, you know, we can't comprehend the one who took the messenger on the journey, nor can we comprehend the messenger in reality, nor can we comprehend the journey itself. Everything we know about it is simply to give us 
a glimpse of things without understanding its reality. And again, the only reason we know this journey is again the the purpose of the journey in Subhana Ladi Asra the Abdihi. He says, Lenuriahu min ayatina to show him our signs, which is an important point to understand. So as Rasulullah continues, whatever that means in this in that realm, and then in the presence of his Lord, when he sees his Lord, he says, Attahiyatulillahi Wassalawat Wattayabat. All reverence is for Allah. And all prayers are all salat. And all purity or all goodness is for Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to him, Assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabi. Peace be upon you. Ayyu. Again, in Arabic, there are various words that can be used as calling words. The more co most common one is ya. I say, yeah, so and so. But ya yeah is something that is used for near, for someone that is near, qareeb, or someone that's far away, ba'id. It can be used for either. Ayyo is only for the one who is present. Present and seeing. Ayyuhan Nabi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And here, Rasulullah does not forget us. Because then he responds, Assalamu alayka wa salamu alayna wa ala ibadillah salihin. And salam also upon those who are righteous. And you have the conversation between Allah and His beloved. Whatever He said. The various people who say, you know, so many words or so many things, but we don't know. And I'm skipping a lot of things, but then he comes back. Points to understand. The... One point is when Allah subhanahu wa talks about the journey, He uses an emphatic statement. Subhana ladhi asra bi abdi. The pure, pure is the one who took his messenger or took his slave you know, on this journey. So it's an emphatic statement. It starts off with subhan. In language, you know, if I want to say something that I don't expect any one to object to, you know, I just I just say it. You know, I don't have to make it emphatic. I don't have to say the sky is blue. Well, I can say the sky is blue, but what I don't have to say is the sky is really blue. You know, unless I'm talking to somebody that's colorblind. Why not? I don't have, you know, I don't have to tell the people, oh, I'm sitting on the member. Everyone seeing me knows I'm sitting on the member. You know. Or rather, I don't have to make this an emphatic statement. I'm, I'm really sitting on the member. You know, everyone here sees where I'm sitting. If it's something that's difficult to believe, then you make it emphatic. I really jump ten feet into the air. Now, I may have used a trampoline doing it, but I really jumped 10 feet into the air. This is something that would be hard to believe. But if something that people would consider impossible, or in reality should be impossible, then I swear by it. You know, this is something that's really going to be hard for people to believe. And so I swear, 
I jump 20 feet into the air. And it's just language. It's just how language is. You know, if it's something, again, no, one, no one's going to deny it. I just say it. If it's going to be hard to believe, now I'll make it emphatic. And if it's something that's really hard or almost impossible to believe, I swear by it, by something. And I swear by something close to me. You know, I swear by my mother. Or I swear by Allah. And swearing by something is not a game either in Islam, which many people have made it these days. Everything's swearing. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the journey going, he makes an emphatic statement. But when he talks about the messenger coming back, he swears by it. When najmi idha hawa. He swears by the star as it descends. And of course, Imam Jafar Sadiq al-Islam said the star here, the Najm is Rasulullah as he comes back from this journey. <coughs> There's a law of gravitation. Everything is pulled towards its origin. You know, even if you think of the Big Bang Theory, you know, everything's pulling on each other. If I take a rock that originated from the earth, I let it go, where does it go? It goes back to the earth. I don't expect it to start floating in the air or going the other way. It's law of gravity. Everything goes back to its origin. The whole universe is pulling on each other, even though it's still expanding, but it's still pulling on each other, so you have a gravity. Barak originated from Jannah. Barak stopped in Jannah. Jibreel al-Islam came from Sidrat al-Muntaha. Where did he stop? Sidrat al-Muntaha. Rasulullah sallallahu what is his origin? You know, according to the hadith of Jabir in Musannaf Abdul Razak, and Abdul Razak rahmatullahi is amongst the teacher of Imam, Abu, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, who is amongst the teacher of Imam Bukhari. And in his Musannaf, a hadith which he says is Sahih, where Jabir ibn Abdullah radi asked Rasulullah Sallam, Ya Rasulullah Sallam, what was the first creation? The Rasulullah Sallam says what? Nur Nabiyaka, the Nur of your Nabi. Which means he is created before place, he is created before time. His creation precedes everything. And you can't even say how long it precedes because there is no time. How do you measure it? So if there's nothing created, then where is Rasulullah? Other than the presence of his Lord. So his natural gravitational pull is back, back, is back to his Lord. So his coming back to us is something unusual. But this is his love for his Ummah. You know, you go someplace, you know, I mean, this world is Darul Huzn, the world of difficulties, the world of sorrows. And you go where there are no difficulties and there are no sorrows. Why do you want to come back? Other than his love for us, for his ummah. And everything, you know, again, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends salam upon him, Rasulullah immediately sends salam upon the righteous of his ummah. The whole conversation, the whole life of Rasulullah is worrying about his ummah. Everything that he did is for his ummah. And yet the ummah has forgotten him. And then we wonder why our condition is like it is. Rasulullah is the beloved of Allah. 
Allah is as samad He is not in need of anything. If all of us deny Him, reject Him, do everything we can against Him, it doesn't make any difference to Him. The lover is willing to forgo and forgive crimes against himself, but the lover does not forgive crimes against his beloved. And so do we think that we can leave the messenger and not have faced any consequences from his lover, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. That is the impossibility. And so if I look at this, you know, again, that's why I asked everyone to read first verse of Surah is Bani Israel, which is Surah. Uh, number 17 and the first 18 verses of Surah Najm. And now when you read these verses in context, and this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنْ نَجْمِ إِذَا هَوَى Then he says, مَا دَلَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ وَمَا غَوَى He swears by that star, by Rasulullah s.a.w. as he comes back from this journey. And then, then he says, uh, and, and, and your companion has not strayed, nor is he error, erred, or made an error. Because what did Quraysh do when he starts telling them about the journey? And he only, he's only telling them about the journey from Mecca to Aqsa. What did they start saying? Oh, you know, he must have seen something. He must be mistaken. Because they also understood that what Rasulullah Sallallahu was telling them, he's not telling them about some dream. Anyone can believe a dream. Oh, you had, I had a dream. Everyone has dreams. They understood that he's talking about going physically. And that's why they said, oh, and we can't believe this. But the interesting thing is, whenever Quraysh challenged Rasulullah Sallallahu Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala answered on behalf of Rasulullah Sallallahu himself. You know, if you look throughout the Quran, when the, when the followers of a various prophet accused him of something, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala tells that prophet, say this to them. When Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala introduces himself, he says to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi tell them, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ وَهَدْ Say to them, Allahu Ahad. Hmm? Yet when it comes to the honor of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Subhanahu doesn't say to Rasulullah Sallallahu you tell them this. He himself says, مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى You know, when Quraysh said, oh, you know, his Lord has forsaken him. He said, your Lord has not forsaken you, nor has he left you. And here, when they're accusing him, oh, he must be, he must have, you know, be, he must be confused. مَا ضَلَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ وَمَا غَوَى He's not. And then he says, وَمَا يَنْتِقْ عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيُ يُوهَى That he does not say anything from his own nafs, from, from his own self, but everything he says is nothing but revelation. You know, because there are people who say that these verses only apply to the Qur'an. But here Rasulullah is not reciting the Qur'an to them, he's telling them about the journey. So every word that comes out of the lips of Rasulullah is exactly as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants him to say, or rather loves for him to say. And he said, Allamahu Shadidul Quwa. He has been taught by the one who's mighty in power. Fastawa. The possessor of soundness and the one established. Which is also interesting because there are people who try to inject Jibreel Islam into this as well. So Allamahu Shadidul Quwa that he's taught by Jibreel, by the one mighty in power, Jibreel. Which is also interesting because if I say to these people that Rasulullah Sallallahu is Shadid al quwa and he is mirratin fastawa, then they say, oh, you've committed shirk. Same people. And yet when it comes, when they want to inject Jareel al-Islam into this, then that, that's not shirk. And then when Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala talks about the nearness, 
of Rasulullah Sallallahu like two bows or even closer than that and he doesn't say how much closer than that but he says فَأَوْهَا إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْهَا and he revealed upon his servant whatever he revealed you know which has many implications meaning who are you to say that you know what he revealed he revealed whatever he revealed who are you to know how much he revealed but even here you know, there's various translations they again they inject Jibreel al-Islam into this فَأَوْهَا إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْهَا they say and he revealed upon his uh, upon his uh, slave whatever he revealed through Jibreel there's no Jibreel in, in the verse but they say oh through Jibreel and then the other aspect if you know the context of what's being said this is this is what's being revealed in in La Makkah where is Jibreel there is no Jibreel Jibreel stopped at Sidrat al-Muntaha. There is no one other than Allah and his Abd and his slave. And that's it. Time's running short. So I'm going to, I'm going to end, I'm going to wrap it up. You know, again, in the beginning, Allah SWT told us why he took him on the journey. Why did he take him on the journey? To show him his signs. لِنُرِيَهُ min ayatina To show him of our signs. From a scientific standpoint, how do I know something exists if I can't see it? Signs. You know, like, like air, I don't see the air, how do I know the air? Because I feel it. You know, when the wind blows, you see the, you know, the grass lays over, the trees bend over. That's a sign. You know, like, you know, for those of you who know me, I, I go, I hunt. So I had patients who would say, oh, you know, come to my land and hunt. Okay. I'm hunting deer. How do I know there are deer there? What do I do? I go to the property, I start looking for signs. You know, markings, rubbings, scrapes, droppings, anything. But if I go to that property, and of course I'm looking for deer, what is the greatest sign of deer there? If I see a deer, right? If I see a deer, I don't need to look for anything else. I know there's deer. So the greatest sign of anything is that thing. And he says in verse number 18 here, لَقَدْ رَأَى مِنْ آيَاتِنَا كُبْرَى لَقَدْ رَأَى مِنْ آيَاتِهِ كُبْرَى For sure, without a doubt, he saw, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from the signs of his Lord, Kubra, the greatest. The greatest sign of anything is that thing. Now here there are people who try to bring the hadith of Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu anha, which is in Bukhari, where when she was this topic came up, alleged she, allegedly she says that how could he have uh, gone or seen because his body was in my bed. Well, many issues with that. Let's say even if I, if I accept that statement. You can compare a statement of one companion of the Prophet to another companion of the Prophet You cannot compare the statement of a companion to the messenger himself. And in Bukhari, when the Rasulullah is asked, did he see Allah? He says, I saw him as Noor. But if I come back to this other statement, one is, you know, the statement, everyone agrees, whether they agree exactly when it happened, 
that's disputable. But everyone agrees that this journey took place in Makkah when Rasulullah was in Makkah. The marriage with Aisha Siddiqa was not completed until second year of Hijri in Medina. So the statement has no validity based on that itself. Uh, you know, may Allah to help us understand. There are many things, you know. Again, I mean, this, any aspect of the life of the Rasulullah is something we could talk about forever and still not scratch the surface. Uh, and when you're talking about this journey, I mean, it's the various aspects of it, every aspect of it, it's just so amazing and beautiful. Uh, again, you know, we, we can't do justice to it. Uh, as I said before, you know, because of the time change, the whole time isn't coming in until about 1.50, so what we'll do for the next few weeks until it shifts is talk will start at 1.45 and end around now, which is... 2.12 or so, first Adhan, people make Sunnah, and then we start the Khutbah and the rest of the schedule, inshallah. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand uh, and give us, you know, fill our hearts with His true love and the true love of His beloved Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, His family, His companions, and all of those whom they love, inshallah. Uh,